Have you ever looked at something before in your life and thought, that's interesting. Why does that do what it does? Or maybe that's a little weird. Why exactly is that a little weird? When my wife and I were on our honeymoon, we were able to honeymoon in Alaska, Homer, Alaska, which was gorgeous. And uh, we went fishing um, as part of our honeymoon. My wife allowed me to take her halibut fishing off the Homer spit, like a two-hour drive or boat ride, I should say, out into the ocean. Of course, I didn't realize it was going to be as intense as it was, but it was intense. For those of you who didn't catch that online, my wife just said in front of everyone that uh, I said it was going to be five and it ended up being 11 hours. She is not wrong about that fact. Just throwing that out there. Uh, you're right, honey. Remember I said that. You're right. But anyway, as we were halibut fishing, it, it was beautiful. It was glorious. We went out, and it, during the summer in Alaska, like the plants soak up that extra sunlight from the extended hours of sun. And everything is brighter, like the plant life, the flowers. It's just gorgeous. So we were out, and there's these little islands. And just the green on them was so much brighter. It almost looked tropical out there. Um, of course, the heat wasn't there to make it tropical, but it was just beautiful. As we're out there, some blue whales go by as we're fishing. And it's a, it's a mama blue whale and a baby. I actually hooked into, I believe it was the baby whale. And I'm reeling, and this thing is, I mean, it's enough it could cap. It's the size of the boat, if not bigger. And I'm like, Captain, I hooked the whale. He's like, you did not give me your pole. He's like, you hooked the whale. <laughs> and so he takes a, a knife, and he cuts it. And uh, we got back to fishing. But anyway, it was a really great experience. And my wife has since forgiven me. Um, she did catch the biggest halibut, just throwing that out there. So... But, you know, one thing interesting and weird about halibut is they, they actually swim flat through the water. And both of their eyes are on top of that flat. But when they're fry, they actually start out swimming like a normal fish. Eventually, they flatten, and then their eye rotates over. Isn't that cool? Kind of crazy. And today, we're continuing on a series on worldview and identity as human beings. And I've titled the sermon today, Identity, No Confusion. No Confusion. And, you know, again, sometimes we can look at things in nature and say, well, that's weird. That's confusing, right? But I don't believe that the God of the universe made us to be confused about who we are. Can I hear an amen to that? And I believe the enemy wants us very confused because as we talked about last week, if he can deceive us about who God is or about who we are, then he can get us to do ju just about anything he wants us to do. That's what happened with Eve, right? God said, you can eat anything except for that one tree. And Satan basically said, you know what? God's holding out on you. Did he really say you must not? He knows if you do that, you'll be like him. So God went after, or excuse me, Satan went after God's identity by saying he's not really good. And then he went after Eve's identity and said, you really aren't that great. But if you take that, you will be. You know what? That's exactly what the enemy of our soul is trying to do to our culture today. He is trying to confuse us about who we are as people. And so last week we took a look at what a worldview is, and I shared kind of the tenets of, of Christian theism, which would be just another way of saying a biblical worldview. And we asked seven questions, and, and the reason I'm going through this is because underneath all of the confusion today is a worldview that basically says we are just matter, there is no God, when we die we will go back to just being nothing again, right? So we're going to study that, but I want to talk, go through again, what is a worldview? So a worldview is a set of presuppositions or assumptions, which may be true, partially true, or entirely false, which we hold consciously or subconsciously, consistently or inconsistently, about the basic makeup of our world. I know that's very wordy, but to put it in layman's terms, it's the lens through which we view the world. It's the assumptions we have about life and, and death and how the world is. So it asks seven basic questions. First, what is prime reality? What is the 
really real? Is it God? Is it just material? What is it? Second, what is the nature of external reality or the world around us? Here are answers points of whether we see the world as created or auton autonomous, chaotic or orderly, matter or spirit. Are we one with the world or is it separate from us? And we talked about some of that last week. What is a human being? Are we made in the image of God or are we something altogether different? What happens to a person at death? Why is it possible to know anything at all? How do we know what is right and wrong? And what is the meaning of human history? And so we're going to take a look at a different worldview from Christian theism that we talked about last week. We're going to take a look at what naturalism says. But first, I ended last week with some identity statements that, my goodness, if we could internalize these and teach the next generation these statements, I think we would be so much further ahead against the lies of the enemy and the lies of our culture. The first, we sang it this morning. I am who God says I am. I am who God says I am. I am not what the culture says I am. I am not what my friends say I am. I am who God says I am. Sometimes we even have to remind ourselves that he has made us the way he has made us. And we need, we need to fight the lies in our own minds, right? Sometimes it's not even voices out there saying junk about us. It's ourselves beating ourselves up. So we have to remind ourselves, I am who God says I am. Second, I am a child of God. I'm a child of God. Third, I am beautifully and wonderfully made. Fourth, I've been made in the image of God. Fifth, God has created me for a specific purpose. Sixth, God did not make a mistake when he made me. Psalm 139 says, For you formed my inward parts. Who formed them? God formed them. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. You know, it's like you can just see the thought and care that God made as he knitted us, as he formed us, as he made us how he wanted us to be. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Like, like God didn't like just willy-nilly throw you together, you know, and, and then you're born and oops, guess I messed up. No, he made you with intent. He made you with purpose. He made you to be you. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. When as yet, there were none of them. God did not make a mistake. Number seven, I am both physical and spiritual the world would say you are only physical right you have personality you have thoughts but you're only physical no 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 when you die you're going somewhere and it matters what you do with your life now and who you put your faith in now for eternity number eight and if you if you claim to be a follower of jesus you have to claim this as well i am not my own 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. So I just really want to emphasize what Paul is, is writing here, saying here. Is what he's saying is that Jesus Christ laid down his life, purchased me with his own blood, a person who is destined for the grave, death, and hell. He has completely washed us, completely cleansed us, and he set us in the heavenlies with him, and one day we will go to be with him. He has completely redeemed us from the pit. And you know what he asked in return? He asked that we honor him with our bodies today. We are not our own. We have been purchased turn to the person next to you and say you've been purchased <laughs> good job all right so you know what not only is god's deal fair it's more than fair right it's extremely gracious that he would offer himself and and give himself for us and in return we say lord 
Yes, I'm in control of my body. I can do what I want with my body. But you know what? I choose to honor Jesus with my body. I choose to say, Lord, how I live in this world is for you. And so what you say about me is more important than what anyone or anything else says about me. And, you know, his plan is just so good, right? Like all of the aspects of life and love and marriage and, and intimacy, these are all blessings from God. That when we walk in them, he brings peace and fulfillment into our lives and, and, and a heritage and blessing. And so, again, God is the author of our identity. Where does the confusion come from? Well, we, we have to remember that we have the, an enemy of our soul. And Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants you dead. He not only wants you dead physically, he wants you dead eternally. And if he can't take your soul, if you've trusted in Jesus, he might try to take you out another way. And if he can't take you out another way, guess what he will do? He will do his best to steal from you. He will do his best to make sure your days are spent without peace, without joy, full of fear, full of anxiety. And you know, we have to fight that. We are in a battle from the time we enter into a relationship with God, from the time we're born, we are in a battle. And either we're progressing towards the Lord or or he's winning in some area of our life. And we don't want the enemy to win because if he can't kill you, he will rob you. And you know what? He's been doing it the same way since creation. He's so subtle. The way he does it is lying to us. He, in, he injects himself into your thoughts. You know, who, who are you anyway? Who do you think you are, Ryan Stockstrom? You're just this. You're just that. What do you think you are? Well, we should reply, well, I'm a child of God. I've been called and equipped and anointed for what God has called me to do in life. We should all be able to say that. Jesus said the exact opposite of Satan. I came that they may have life and have it to the full. When we follow Jesus' as truth and ways, we will live abundant, blessed lives according to the Creator's design. And we do that by continually exposing ourselves and walking in, believing truth. We have to believe truth in order to walk in freedom. Partial truth does not equal full freedom. Right? Twisted truth does not equal full freedom. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so what God says about your identity is it. He's got the final word. So I want to go back to a naturalistic worldview because, again, I believe that, you know, through the theory of evolution and our scientific era and all these things that we've, we've really, we're surrounded by a naturalistic worldview that has influenced all realms of society, including what we're teaching kids, psychology, um, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying science is bad, right? Science is good. Science was meant to discover what God has already done. Science is meant to bring out what God has already done. Unfortunately, what scientists today do is they say, I have a theory, and I'm going to make sure that my theory is your theory. And they, they've twisted the word of God and what is true. All right. So a natural, naturalistic worldview, what do they believe? Number one, that matter exists eternally and is all there is. God does not exist. In Christian theism, as we looked last week, God is the be-all and end-all of everything. In naturalism, matter is the be-all and end-all. And, and, and they believe, number two, what's the natural um, or the nature of external reality? They believe the cosmos, which is just the ordered universe, exists as a uniformity of cause and effect in a closed system. In other words, there's a whole bunch of matter. It always was. It always will be. Matter takes different shapes and different forms because matter interacts with each other. But someday, all that's going to be is matter again. 
So how do you think that affects the value of human life? If all we are is matter, and when we die, we just go back to being disorganized matter, it tells you what? It tells you this life has no deeper meaning. It tells you that at the end of my life, I go nowhere. I just disassemble. What a terrible, tragic lie. And it also tells us that a child in the womb has no value. It's just matter, right? Where, where do we think this culture is bought into killing children? We believe this stuff. That's why. Church, we got to rise above. We got to fight this junk. It also tells me that if I'm just matter, I can do anything with my body I want to. And with that comes a whole load of confusion. And we're going to take a look at some of that confusion. So number three, what is a human being? Naturalists describe human beings as complex machines. Personality is therefore an interrelation of chemical and physical properties we do not yet fully understand. One 18, in the 1800s, uh, Pierre Cabanis wrote, the brain secretes thought as the liver secretes bile. You know, so even our thoughts are just a form of some kind of material function. And it, so it takes the value of human beings being made in the image of God to all the way down here. You're just matter, and you happen to have thoughts because somehow this process evolved. What a lie. Fourth, death, and I mentioned this, death is the extinction of personality and individuality. Fifth, how can we know anything? Consciousness and rationality were developed under the contingencies of survival in a long process of evolution. So I, in their mindset, I, I don't think because I was made like God to think. I'm not creative because God is creative. I think because I had to survive. I think because as I evolved, I was able to develop thought, and that made human beings above the ordered creation. And it's just crazy. You know, when you really break down the naturalist viewpoint, it's way harder to believe in than Christian theism. That there was a, an infinite God who made us in his image. It's way harder for me to believe that an amoeba turned into a fish, turned into a whale, turned into something that walks on the ground, turned into an ape, and eventually turned into us. Really? People actually believe this stuff. And, and because of it, they take the value of humans and they throw it to the ground. But if we've been made in God's image, that means that all of us have value. Every human life has value. Every human life. And, and really, in Christ, we're all one. You know, this world is all up in arms right now about race. And I can't, I'm not going to say I fully understand all the intricacies of the, of the arguments being made right now. So I don't really want to go there. But I do want to say, in Christ, we are one. Because all people have value. All people have been made in the, in the image of their creator. And if we could just stand on that, I think there'd be a lot less confusion there as well. How do we know right and wrong? They say that ethics is only man-made. It's a result of culture, of a harmonious adjustment of people to each other and their environment. Instead of, we know right and wrong because we serve a God who said this is right and this is wrong. <laughs> And he made us to be like him with, with, with morality. We're made in his image. What's the meaning of human history? They say history is a linear stream of events linked by cause and effect, but without an overarching purpose. You need an antidepressant to get through that, people. Joking, of course. But seriously. And, and, and that is what the modern humanistic scientific world is trying to instill into us and largely we bought it we bought it and and it affects everything again and it affects our our sexuality it affects what people say is right and wrong again if we're just matter why is there right and wrong to begin with let's just do what we want with our bodies here and now and i, I want to talk a little bit about 
just some of the lies that I see about our sexuality, our, our gender. Um, there's an illustration that I, I don't have it with, but it's called the genderbred person. You can look it up at genderbread.org. And within that, it's, it's obviously targeting children, which is extremely sad in and of itself. But the genderbred person, they try to explain the four different areas that make up a person's gender. And, and, and I just want to read what it says a little bit. They say, the schema used here to map out gender allows individuals to plot where they identif identify along both continua to represent varying degrees of alignment with the traditional binary elements of each aspect of gender, resulting in infinite possibilities of gender. Also, there's, there's the gingerbread, gen, gingerbread person. They ruined the gingerbread man. That was my favorite kid story. Come on. The gingerbread person. And so they say there's, there's four to five areas that make up someone's gender. Their gender identity, their gender expression, their biological sex and sexual orientation or desire, and then even romantic can be separate from that. So gender identity. I can think I am a gender. That's number one. And I can think I have a traditional role or I have a non-traditional role or I can be anywhere along the continua. Gender expression. Do I express that gender, male or female, or somewhere on a line in between? Biological sex. What parts do I have? That's probably the most concrete thing in the whole thing. And sexual orientation or desire. Who am I attracted to? What gender or type of gender am I attracted to? And they're basically saying there's an infinite number of genders out there now. Infinite number of genders? I don't know about you, but that's more confusing to me than a halibut that swims sideways. <laughs> This world is going nuts. But you know why? Because they have given up true north. They have said there is no God. And therefore, I can be and do whatever I think I want to be and do. It's all about me. But you know what? Number eight of those identity statements, I am not my own. If I follow Jesus, I am not my own. So when God made me a boy, guess what? I'm a boy, right? If God made you a girl, you're a girl. I do not believe God makes mistakes. I just don't. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to offend anybody with this. I really don't. But I do want to offend the lies of the enemy that are being thrown down our throats because they're not true. They're just not true. Gender identity is not about what I think my gender identity is about. It's about who God made me to be. Genesis, and if nothing else, they even have the audacity in this illustration to say, they quote Albert Einstein, and they say, everything should be simple enough that a six-year-old could explain it. Right? That's what Albert Einstein said. And then they have this huge, long, confusing thing in the form of a gingerbread person. You know what? God made it simple enough for a six-year-old to fully understand it. We don't need to confuse it. Man has confused it terribly. Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Two. Dos. I don't know any other foreign languages that say two. But two, that's it. We get two. We get two choices, all right? And, and, and I'm not saying that there aren't people who are, are, are confused. Because there are people who are confused. And this doesn't help anything. But, and you know what? I just, I just have to say, go back to the scripture. Go back to your relationship with God. Don't look for answers in the world. They're going to make you worse when it comes to the areas of sexuality and identity. And, 
I, I just don't believe God is an author of confusion. God said, let them be made my image, male and female. Very simple. Humanity says, let's make people whatever they want to be. Very confusing. I don't believe God is a God of confusion. And I don't believe he made a mistake when he made you. Amen? Because if Satan can cause doubt about who you are or who God is, he can get you to do almost anything he wants you to do. And so what do we do with this? You know, what do we do with our our culture? What do we do with our society? What do we do with these lies? Well, I, I would say we should be standing up to them in a respectful way on a local level as much as possible. So if you see it come through your classroom, you should call your administrator. Be like, look, we're getting a pile of garbage in the mail today. We should say something. We can affect change locally more effectively than we'll ever change the national scene. But you know what? We can make a stand. We can take a stand. Respectful stand. Loving stand. A stand based in truth. And if if you know if you have someone in your life that's confused, I want to encourage you, love them. Love them. Be Jesus to them. Don't be a hater. Don't say, well, you're some kind of outcast. No, love them. And if you have enough relationship with them, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. A half-truth isn't going to set someone free. But just say, look, I love you. I love you. But I want you to know that the Bible makes it so much simpler and so much more clear. And, and I wish you'd go this way because I've seen God come through and break through in my life. And then put your arm around them and love them. They're, they're all, if they're confused enough to believe this stuff, they're already hurting. They're already going through something. And, and we need to love people where they're at. And, and, and we, sometimes as Christians, we do come across very... Ah, oh, just judgmental and harsh. It's because we're saying truth like this, but we have no relationship with them. And so that's where we just, we have to be gentle with the truth. We have to speak it. I'm not saying don't. That's why I preached this this morning, and I, I did so with a little bit of angst. I'm not going to lie. Because I know it, it flies in the face of culture. But I, I do know the truth sets us free. Ephesians 4.15 says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And as we speak the truth in love to our friends and our family and people that we're connected with about this, I believe that we can help bring freedom, real freedom into people's life. Again, I, I don't think it does anybody any good to say, so you believe that? Good, I believe that about you too. You you go, guy, girl, you go. I don't think that really brings freedom to anyone. But say, wow, you believe that? That's that's interesting to me. Tell me more. I want to get to know you. I want to get I want to show love to you in Jesus' name. And as you know them, hey, you know what? The scripture is so clear and it set me free in so many ways. And I'm not judging you, but I want you to know this. And I believe that that will eventually speak truth and, and freedom, real freedom into people's lives. I'm not saying it's easy, church. We live in a complex time. Oh, my goodness. We live in a complex time. And yet God is still so crystal clear. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your church. I thank you for your bride. Lord, you say you're going to prepare us to be a, a beautiful bride for you. So, Lord, once again, we, we attach ourselves to the truth of our identity in you, that we are children of God. Lord, that we've been born and made in your image, and we have dignity and value and purpose because of that. Father, I pray for truth to once again ring out in our land. 
Father, I pray for biblical truth to be taught in churches. Father, I pray for Christians to stand for truth. Lord, I pray that where we have allowed the world to infiltrate our lives and our understanding, Lord, that we would turn back to you, God, and, and that in love we would say there's a different way. It's, it's Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, we thank you for working in us. We thank you for being good to us. And Lord, before I close, I lift up my brother Lucas before your throne of grace. I pray that you bless Chad, Karen, Lucas as he's in recovery. God, we just pray for a complete and full recovery for that young man. We lift up all the people in our lives that, not mentioning God, that are going through something. Father, I just pray that you'd wrap them in your arms of love this morning. In the name of Jesus. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Be blessed, everyone. Great to see you here this morning. Have a great week.